Thank you everyone for coming. Welcome. I'm uh, John Lockhart and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Education. It's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to welcome you all and to introduce uh, Lucas Walsh to you. The, um, the routine here tonight is it's being videotaped because in the, the modern era we put all these things up on the web for them to chase. So Lucas, when you're speaking, don't wander too far from the spot here. It's very important. For everyone who's come tonight, thank you very much. It's um, this era, you know, when so many things are virtual rather than live and real, presents interesting time, space, opportunity and challenges for us. We still feel as though it's important to have these types of presentations where you can actually have an opportunity to see the person face to face, live, real, here, and talk to them afterwards about their ideas. Lucas Walsh has come to us, he came last year and he's running the Berwick campus for the Faculty of Education, he's done an absolutely magnificent job. The reason Lucas is here is because he's an outstanding academic, a leader in the field and working in ways that are a little bit different to what many of us older academics have come from. Lucas has been working in the philanthropic world for quite some time and has made quite a difference in that area and has now come back to academia and we're very pleased to have him here at Monash and in the Faculty of Education. It's interesting also that Lucas is of the modern era in which he's able to get the press to pay attention to what he's doing on the day that he's doing a presentation. So I'm not sure how many of you saw his op-ed piece in the paper today in The Age. You should go and have a look at it, although I'm sure he's going to touch on that tonight. He's also had a bevy of radio interviews today as a consequence of this piece. One of the things that Lucas has done has been able to bring to life his research into what the younger generation do, expect, believe, wonder, think about of today. And so I look forward to listening to you tonight, Lucas. Again, it's a great pleasure to have you here at Monash. We're so pleased that you came home. It's a wonderful thing. So everybody, I offer you this evening a presentation from Associate Professor Lucas Walsh. Thank you, Lucas. Thanks, John. I've been told I've got, a, I've got my parameters. We've actually scoped out. I actually like to prowl. Many of you have seen me present before. So I've got this invisible line around me. It's one of those rare times which I could have used uh, pantomime during a presentation, but alas. Uh, I'm going to ask for your indulgence this evening. Um, I, I've been very fortunate as a researcher to be able to carve my own pathway and my own sets of interests over the years. Um, they've taken me all over the world and they've taken me into very different kinds of contexts. I'm talking about uh, research and practice and teacher professional development in the area of technology for the International Baccalaureate or working with indigenous and remote communities uh, in developing joined up communities in Western Australia or alternatively more recently uh, work with the Foundation for Young Australians which I'm still proudly a senior research fellow looking into issues such as youth transitions and young people and power. I'm also involved in another project, an ARC project, with, uh, with uh, our partners at the University of Western Sydney and a range of other corporate partners looking into young people and technology and the role of technology in their well-being. The reason I tell you all of this is that, and why I've asked for your indulgence, is that tonight I'm going to try to push those areas of research together. Often in the type of work that I do, particularly in the policy work or some of the work that I've done with the corporate sector, is they ask you questions again and again. What are the big drivers? What are the big things that we should be looking for? Now, as any of us knows, living in the world, there are a range of things that we could put at the top of that priority. Tonight, I've picked four. And there's a case for picking those four, which I hope will become apparent as I talk to you about these areas tonight. But this is pretty much one of the first times that I've tried to, to bring this together because I think at least some of it will be of interest. I warn you, I'm about to hit you with a lot of data. Data is important to me, evidence is important to me, uh, and I'm not necessarily sure where a lot of this data is going to fall. So I hope to be able to enter into a conversation with you guys and maybe you'll give me some ideas. You know the topic is the big four. I've decided to 
zoom in on these four key drivers. The world's population in 2011 passed 7 billion. Concentration of that population is directly to the north of Australia. It's also enmeshed within that is the changing nature of our demography as a society. This has particularly profound implications for young people. Most recently I've been involved in looking into young people's attitudes, attitudes and ways of making change. And the research is surprising. There's 20 years where we're getting consistent themes about young people's disengagement and marginalisation, but perhaps there are some new things to be learned, which essentially is what the op-ed piece that John was talking about is about. Young people's changing use of technology is another driver which I'll elaborate. Environmental change, I won't go into a great deal of detail, I will touch on as it relates to the other three, but in terms of its implications for education, one of the forthcoming uh, of these Dean's lecture series will be by our colleague Alan Reid who'll be talking about education, environmental sustainability. And I think that's something more that he'll do a far better job at than I will. So, what we want to do is we want to try to tease and understand where young people are at looking at some of these key trends and data. We're going to look very quickly at politics, the economy and the environment. One of the reasons we need to look at what the data is telling us, and in particular what young people are telling us, is because of headlines like these. Gen Ys have tickets on themselves. As part of a project looking into young people's relationship to power and change, as part of the environmental scan that I conducted, I looked at 15 years of news items about, uh, about young people. And frankly, it makes a sickening read. Headline after headline after headline talking about young people as apathetic, young people as disengaged, young people as entitled, young people as lazy, young people as immature, young people as disoriented, young people as having, having tickets on themselves. Well, when we try to understand the context in which this kind of discourse prevails and the context around young people themselves, we start to see an unsettling picture about that environment. Let's start to delve into it. Firstly, let's look at young people's participation. I've cherry-picked from a range of data sources, and I'm happy to provide those data sources, but for the sake of the public lecture, I'm just going to skim over the top of them, like an insect across the pond. 17 to 25-year-olds are the least likely of the Australian population to be enrolled to vote. Approximately half say they do not understand the essential conditions of a democracy. Youth voting tends to be more progressive where it does take place, amongst young women than young men. Fluctuations between the 2007 and 2010 elections suggest that this orientation is by no means fixed to one party. We've seen shifts across parties. Um, but there are some interesting things that emerge. And one of the most important as we approach the election is that as the Whitlam Institute has pointed out in, uh, in Sydney, young people make up about 30% of the voting population, but there is yet untapped. We've had some modest efforts to connect with them, um, such as the Kevin 07 election, and we see that he's trying to get the youth vote again. But when we drill down and look at that segment of society, it's not a segment, it actually consists of quite a diverse group internally. But there are some things, some trends that we can glean from those. Notably, there's been a shift in young people aged 15 to 24 towards issue-based, what it's called politics of choice. We've seen a large-scale rejection of the old ideological bases that are familiar to us. Left, right, um, core social movements, and in particular political parties. Of course, it's not confined to Australia. It's actually prevalent across, uh, across democracies throughout the world. When we ask them consistently in the research over the last 15 years, key messages keep coming out. They feel excluded from policy making. And interestingly, they might define the political differently. What do I mean by this? There's an, a case that I bring up again and again, and colleagues who have seen me throughout the years, including one or two in the audience, have heard this a million times, and in fact, met the person that I'm referring to. Um, Ros Black and I seated just there, we're involved in some research looking at young social entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurs are people who use a combination of non-for-profit and corporate mechanisms in order to be able to bring about uh, social change. They, try, they don't work for profit, they work to bring about 
uh, and, and generate social investment. So we're interviewing one of these guys, this, this young guy Jack Haggerty. Um, he's trying to bring it, uh, about change in, uh, in a rural city within Victoria. What he's engaged in is trying to address and combat homophobia. He's knocked on the doors of local government. He is completely frustrated by the length of time and the relative disinterest and the slowness of the process of local government. He's, in he's intensely engaged in a project of social justice. He's about shifting power relations and understanding gendered relations within this community. Right? His project is, on one level, about power. Ask him. Is what, he, is, what, is what you're doing political? And he goes, don't know, don't care, right? I just want to bring about change. There's a clue in that story about how we understand the political and where we prioritise political participation uh, might have shifted over time. We see a vibrant substrata of young people who are engaged, who are bright, who are uh, uh, seeking to make change, but they don't show up in our conventional frames of reference. We go back to the old conventional notions of what participation means, such as enrolling to vote. But we see different patterns of participation emerging. They're rejecting unions and political parties, but they're not necessarily apathetic, as one of the major electoral studies has shown. They just don't consider political parties to be representative of issues that impact upon them. And they show a consistent interest in big ticket items like human rights, the economy, racism, equality, above all else, the environment. And this is the interesting thing, and I think the thing that perhaps many of our politicians don't get is when you go across the surveys, the various types of surveys of young people over the last 15 years, you will see these big ticket items coming up again and again and again and again. And then, of course, the corollary of that is to ask the question, well, how and to what extent have we responded to some of these? To what extent have we been listening? The other interesting thing is that their views are not all that divergent from surveys and studies done of the rest of the population. They are actually consistent and overlap with the older members of the population. What does this suggest to me? It suggests to me that their voice doesn't necessarily count. And they know it, and they see it, and they respond to it. Uh, social commentator and journalist Michael Short, I've just picked a few quotes there. He said, most AFL teams have more members than the ALP, which reportedly has a national membership of about 35,000. That's less than half of the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, which is one of these enterprises that's been set up to bring about climate change and very successful so far in that endeavour, I think, in terms of spreading the, the message. And I pick another quote there from a Brazilian protester. You know, there's, these protests have erupted recently about a whole range of issues, but they've galvanised... Uh, not just young people, but the entire population. They range everything from the price of a ticket fare on a train through to the cost of bringing a soccer event to uh, Rio de Janeiro. Anyway, this uh, Maria, this Brazilian protester, said something interesting which also gives you a, a little sense or a little window. She said, this is not a social movement, not a political movement. This has nothing to do with ideology. We don't want parties in this demonstration. Young people, uh, according to one of the general social surveys, are, are found to be less likely to engage in civic activities than older people. For 18 to, sorry, for 18 to 24 year olds, the two most common forms of engagement are signing a petition and ethical consumption. Ethical consumption means uh, you boycott a product because you don't like where it's made. You, you feel as though there's some injustice involved with it. Uh, the ways in which young people exercise corporate or commercial power is something that we don't fully understand and we certainly don't measure very well. But in a society that's consumed by the economy and the economic interests, would this not seem as a logical way of, uh, of responding? Young women tend to be more engaged in civic activities than men. Young people combining paid work with study are most likely to engage in civic activities. And there is a, an important connection between education, schooling, work and participation. And this is borne out in the evidence again and again. What that relationship is, is a little bit harder to untangle. But there is a relationship between your level of education, the type of activity you're doing, and your level of work, and your participation in other forms of civic activity. I'll come back to that later. 
Perhaps most worryingly in the third trend I'd like to touch on is, a, is a, and you might have read about it, this Lowy Institute poll that's been taken the last two years. They've asked a range of questions around foreign policy. One of them was about uh, people's relationship and, and thoughts about democracy and government. And they found that only 48% of 18 to 29 year old Australians say they prefer democracy to any other kind of government. You think about that for a moment, to any other kind of government. Now you think, start to untangle, well, what, what might that mean? Now, to some extent, there's nothing surprising about that because we've seen a, a, a shift away from engagement with certain formal processes of democracy over the last few years. I would add to that, and what comes out of the research in the UK is it's how we define what do you mean by democracy and what do you mean by government. It's the perception of what those things are like that are important. So, for example, you or I or a young person will have been watching TV and the internet and engaging the news and they will have seen approximately six years of knifings, of political backstabbing, of three word slogans, of legal impropriety uh, and pretty much childish behaviour in Parliament across our screens again and again. And one question would be to say, well, how do you respond to this? Would you want to get involved? That's one layer of it. It becomes all the more ironic when we see one of our supposed future leaders saying, let's get the adults back in charge. Would this not strike anyone as ironic, given the behaviour of, let's name him, Mr Abbott in Parliament, right? Amongst all of our politicians, we see this kind of behaviour. What kind of message is that sending out? Another important factor to understand here is young people in the economy. And what you see on one level is this politics of choice where young people are directed towards issue-based politics. They're slipping and sliding from election to election in terms of who they vote for. It's, it's an unpredictable and a rather fluid cohort in its behaviour, if you can call it a cohort. Cohorts is a better word at best. And some of you have heard me talk about this before, but I'm just going to summarise what the fluidity of working life looks like for young people with some of, this, some of this key data. Firstly, when we ask young people themselves and we look at things like the Mission Australia survey, which is done year on year, we see this rise in young people uh, in, in the importance of the economy. And if we look across different surveys, we kind of see the environment and the economy going like this in terms of levels of priority. The economy has become more important uh, in recent years the uh, proportion of young people valuing a job rose from 16% to 22% in 2011, for example. Only family friendships, uh, family relationships and friendships ranked higher within those surveys and those types of relationships tend to be consistently important to young people. Family remains important to young people. Um, perhaps if we get time to discuss that, I'll come back to that at the end. But here are the big numbers, the numbers that describe uh, the environment that young people who supposedly have tickets on themselves are actually entering into. In June, the number of young people looking for full-time work had increased to its highest rate in 15 years. We've seen a steady decline of opportunities for full-time work decreasing over the last 20, 20 to 25 years, last 20 years definitely. And it doesn't appear as though that's changing. That trend goes steadily down and it appears to be continuing to go down. The rate of full-time employment amongst teenagers not in education decreased by more than 22 percentage points since the mid-80s. And what's more, we get messages again and again through ABS and other data saying young people want to work more, but they can't. They can't find secure jobs. Even amongst university graduates, we see this quite steep decline in some areas that actually, just as a side note, coincides with the uncapping of student places and the GFC, but the global financial crisis. Around 40% of the overall workforce in Australia is non-permanent. The rate of casualisation across this workforce increased from 18.9% in 1988 to around 25% last year. Three times as many teenagers and more than twice as many young adults had part-time jobs in 2011 than in the mid-80s. Think about that. Twice as many young adults had part-time jobs in 2011 than in the mid-80s. An average of nearly one in five teenagers changed their labour force status every month in 2011, compared to one in ten older workers. 30% of the 800,000 plus part-time workers uh, who would prefer to work more 
was aged 15 to 24 years. This sets up the economic frame for the worlds of work for young people. It's fluid, full-time security is declining, and what's not there is vulnerability to economic shocks. When we look at the global financial crisis, we see that it had an immediate and disproportionate effect on young people. They felt it immediately, whether they were in apprenticeships or in, in the sectors that most employ young people, retail and services, they were disengaged. And what's more, the trends show a long tail. When they become disengaged, they can stay disengaged for quite a long time, or we'll marginalise is a better term. Um, so we've got this fluidity and this decline in security and what sociologists call this precarity. So we have this kind of other notion of choice that's around it. Young people are choosing not to work the same hours. They're, they're, there's some element of choice. But really, choice is arguably illusory. And I've just plucked a couple of other figures out here. In broader industries, and these aren't necessarily higher employees of young people, but it's just to give you a, a sense. In industries such as rental, hiring and real estate services, over 97% of full-timers choose their holidays compared to 69% of casuals. 55% of full-timers have access to flexible time off compared to only 18.9% of casuals. Many are okay to, to uh, you know, to forego their, their flexibility, uh, to forego certain things, for they're okay with flexibility, um, but what they forego is the capacity to plan. And I, I, time and time again, I quote some wonderful research from the University of Melbourne, from, um, our colleagues, Dan Woodman and, and others, who have looked in their life patterns project at these young people in the workforce, and he tells a terrific story, terrific on one level, from a research point of view, not so terrific on another level. Story goes like this, young fella, uh, works in the service industries, he works in hospitality. Anyone who's worked in hospitality knows you work crazy hours, it's unpredictable. Um, he's not too worried about that. When he finishes work, he can go onto Facebook or he can tweet and say, is anyone up for a beer? And he can maintain some social networks through that. What he can't do is plan. And this is the key. He can't plan for key events because he doesn't know when he's going to be called into work. And this is something that permeates these young people who are working in this sector. They can't secure loans for houses because of their, uh, uh, because of their, they're on a contract basis or a casual basis. They ha might have trouble planning significant family events. They might have trouble planning as to when they have a family. And this might suggest, combined with other economic factors such as the nature of the housing market, why the traditional measures of maturity are being, measures of maturity by the way, we'll come back to that later, are being pushed further out in life insofar as they're starting families later, they're buying houses later, and they're entering full-time secure employment later, if, if they can get it. But the overall market, as those, the, that data there sort of suggests, is actually changing. The workforce has changed. Fluidity is, uh, is, is far more normal in the, in the workforce. Our education system, and then I'm, I'm, I'm jumping the gun a little bit here, but, but our education system is fundamentally geared towards school completion and, and to higher education. I mean, that's, that's underpinning it. Sure, we have alternative pathways through vocational education and training, but these are, one could say, less developed than in other countries. They're under fire at the moment with massive funding cuts across all levels and uh, nationally. But we do know a few things, that those who complete Year 12 or equivalent will do better in life across a range of indicators, uh, economically, socially and other forms of well-being. Young people who are fully engaged express satisfaction with their life as a whole. And that could be someone graduating from a university or a trainee apprentice. Apprentices will, will often indicate high levels of satisfaction because they've got money in their pocket and they know where they're going. And that's part of the key. Having a sense of a pathway is a key to success of knowing where you're going and enjoying the benefits of financial security and the other benefits with this. And part of that is being able to plan. A survey of 300 Australian finance bosses suggested that staff under the age of 30 have, reports one journalist, quote, an inflated and often delusionary perception of the value they add to an organisation. According to this survey, what, did the, what were the issues that came up with the, uh, with the under 30s? Retaining them. High expectations from them of career advancement, remuneration, demands around work-life balance. This is interesting to me, right, because, we, and I'm just throwing this out there, right, 
if you're enjoying the benefits of a society, and if your society from one generation to, ne to the next has actually improved, and you are in fact wanting better conditions for your young, for, for the people that come after you, then for young people to turn around and to say, well, actually, I don't want to work in one career, I don't want to be a slave to my job, I don't want to be a slave to my mortgage, I actually want a better life with balance. On one level, one would think you'd be quite happy with that view of the world because it's better than the generation before. But we get this conflicting message sent that for them to demand these things somehow seems unreasonable in a society, by the way, that's come out of approximately three decades of uninterrupted economic prosperity. The other thing about this is that, um, is that loyalty becomes a rather rich thing to ask for given the lack of uh, security that young people may in fact be encountering across their working life. I mean, they change jobs often out of necessity, not out of choice. Over the last two decades, I'm quoting a, a, another commentator, over the last two decades, young workers have started to keep their option, uh, options open, not from choice, but out of necessity. No one will offer them a real job. So if young people are the lion's share of casuals and their job conditions carve them out as a virtual underclass, what do you really expect them to do? I think that's a fair question. And it's not local, it's global. The GFC and austerity measures have crippled employment opportunities for uh, Europe's young people. In, in Greece and Spain, we saw youth unemployment levels quite a while back ex exceed 50%. As a result, reports are coming out that there are these migrations of young people, particularly in Spain, trying to find work, trying to find security, uh, and it's changing and fund fundamentally messing with the population bases of these countries and the nature of their labour force. Uh, another observer, a British observer, says well, what we're seeing is a new sociological type, the graduate with no future, and I thought it was worth quoting him at length. The prospect of 10 years of fiscal retrenchment in some countries means they now know they will be poorer than their parents, and the effect has been like throwing a light switch. The prosperity story is replaced by the doom story, even if for individuals reality will be more complex and not as bad as they expect. They're experiencing unprecedented levels of uncertainty, precarity and insecurity after school. Worldwide, as many as 290 million 15 to 24 year olds are not participating in the labour market, which The Economist estimated was approximately a quarter of the world's youth and a group almost as large as the population of America. The long term impact of the youth unemployment crisis can be felt for decades too. It has the same long tail that we've seen here, only we just had a far more lighter touch version of it. Persistent unemployment, proliferation of temporary jobs and a growing youth discouragement in advanced economies uh, sits in contrast to the poor quality and formal subsistence jobs in developing countries. Globally, there is reportedly a mismatch between skills and jobs. And I'd like you to think about that last phrase for a minute there, a mismatch between skills and jobs, because I'm going to come back to that in the last part of this presentation. Pause for a moment. We think about people's relationships socially and with each other. Uh, we've looked at their relationship uh, in, in, through worlds of work and their relationship politically. Um, and of course, intersecting and cutting across these is their use of technology. Some quick stats. The total number of internet users in Australia was estimated to be around 79% of the population. Facebook had around about 11.8 million users, although there'll be people with multiple accounts and, and dead accounts there to be taken in. Australians are around eight, year, around eight years old when they first used the internet. Around 76% of young people aged 9 to 16 go online daily. Those aged 12 to 17 use the internet on an average rate of 2.9 hours a day, although that estimate has gone up and it varies a little bit. 90% of uh, people aged 12 to 17 regularly use social networking sites. 75% of teens are on these sites four to seven days a week. 66% have over 200 friends on their social networking services, SNS. 73% uploaded pictures. Children as young as eight years old are sharing photos with strangers and arranging to meet them. 43% of teenagers who had first met someone online later met them face to face. Uh, there's still a pervasive attitude that one sees about technology that, um, that the cyber world 
is somewhere else, that the cyber is this other abstract place that people go. But if you talk to young people themselves, and if you want to make a young person's eyes roll and get bored quickly, put cyber in front of what you're talking about. Cyber safety, cyber space, right? Because for the bulk of the ones certainly that we've encountered in our research, they don't see a difference. It's all part of the one world. It's all intersex. There are no boundaries. The boundaries are changing. They're permeable. And what's more, the behaviours online mirror behaviours offline in some but not all cases. In, there's a number of cases of cyberbullying where the perpetrators of the bullying thought that it was different to bullying in face-to-face. -face. They felt they didn't feel as though it had the same consequences. So there's some tensions there. It's not as, it's not as simple as, as, as one, might, one might expect. Privacy is another interesting dimension of it. Children are selling or swapping their online passwords at school, according to an ACMA study. 41% of teenagers have shared their personal details online, mobile phone numbers, home phone numbers, or email addresses. They're increasingly using private messaging to keep their cyber lives secret. I've used that term, cyber lives. Look, I just put myself to sleep. Um, from parents and teachers. But 75% of teenagers said that privacy was important to them. So then you've got to ask the question, what do they mean by privacy? And is it the same one that we're used to? And is it the same one that lies at the foundation of our security, of our home lives, of our private lives and our public lives? And the answer is, it's probably something a bit different. 29% of Australian children say they've been bullied compared to 19% across Europe. 13% say this occurred on the internet compared to 6%. Bullying often takes place between 1 to 4 a.m. And I raised that, I plucked that figure out too because it talks about the permeable space of not only of the internet but of time. See, when you get bullied at school, often school would end, you'd get in the school, uh, get in the car, get on the bus, get on the, the bike and you'd leave it. But that's not often the case anymore. It follows you. It's the world there travels with you. You don't go to a space, you bring the spaces with you. And this is all the more so because of the shift towards portable devices. And of course we're seeing an inexorable movement towards the types of portable devices that you've got here, your phones and your iPads. In fact, uh, according to the uh, International Telecommunications Union and the ITU, mobile use had actually replaced land-based computers in most developing countries a few years ago. It surpassed it. And the trends all indicate that we're all heading in that same direction. So, portability means that you take these things wherever you are. And amongst, our, amongst some of our... Um, Young people that we've been dealing with, again, talking about some work that Ros and I have done, they'll have their devices on all the time, wherever they are, even if they don't anticipate they're going to use them. The world is changing. What comes out educationally as well as in the social use of media is that they expect their information and communications technology to be available throughout daily life. This is including people in disadvantaged areas and those with low connectivity. They still expect the technology to be, to be available to them. We found this in our own work looking at um, disengaged learners within the VET sector. Uh, the, the problem with trying to understand this challenge is that there's a lot of hyperbole and hysteria surrounding it. You'll get panic about the, the doom and the worry of the technology and what's happening. But in fact, it's what's being occurring online is often replicating what takes place face to face because those boundaries are permeable and blurred. And what we're finding is that young people are far more savvy about its use than we give them credit for. And I'm not talking about savvy in the sense of being at their technical proficiency, but savvy in the sense of looking for warnings and markers as to how they evaluate who they're talking to when they're using Instagram or, or, or Snapchat or whatever their device, their chosen platform or app is, they're actually quite discerning. Um, and it appears to be relating, relate closely to parentage and to their peers, their modelling and mirroring behaviours. And funnily enough, the behaviours that we see and that we use in engaging in everyday this life, face-to-face -face life, are uh, actually uh, often appropriate and applicable in the online environment. But that's another... Uh, that's another discussion. So we're seeing this blurring of boundaries between public and, public and private life and reshaping how young people engage with the world. Um, why is Kevin Bacon up there? Who's, who's, uh, has anyone played the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? 
Come on, hands up. This is, my, this is the one interactive part of this presentation. Roz, thank you. You've heard of it? Can you explain what it is? Yeah. Uh, so based on that sort of um, really um, that, that idea that's really quite common in the popular culture that you can trace your connection to up to six, six degrees of preparation, if you can pick any given group of people and find the point of connection between them, uh, there's actually been an activity undertaken where you can uh, almost any given group of people, especially you know, in a Western, Western country, can trace 4.4 degrees of separation between themselves and Kevin Bacon. So if you're through, through colleagues, through family, through associations, you can actually make that link. And that, that 4.4 degrees occurred within a study done on Facebook by University of Milan, where they looked at, four, where they looked at 700 million users and extrapolated from that that there was 4.4 degrees of separation from, between those users and each other. Um, the nature of connectedness, however abstract it might seem to us, is changing. Globalisation dissolves boundaries. Social networks become more fluid. Boundary between public and private is being eroded. And then we get these kinds of challenges. Do young people care about surveillance? You get conflicting data. Study was done of teenagers in the UK and asked them, how do you feel about all of these uh, surveillance cameras being placed around the town? They said, actually, we feel more secure. Another group of studies, however, said we feel it's invasive. We actually don't have a, I don't think there's necessarily a clear message about that. But we are seeing these, these changes in attitudes. And I've, I've really talked about those other ones enough, I think. Few provocations. 4chan is, a, is an image notice board sharing device uh, developed by this guy, Christopher Poole. And he said, anonymity is authenticity. It allows you to share in a completely unvarnished, raw way. Anonymity is authenticity. So when we see uh, the terrible kinds of trolling activities that occur on the web, the offensive comments that people make, uh, you know, we think, well, that's because you can remain anonymous. This young person sees it differently. They see it as an authentic form of behaviour, freed from the social norms that we normally, that we normally restrict our behaviour, such as civility. Right? Now, at first, you might recoil at that notion, but really think about it. Think about what he's saying. I'm not sure, I don't know how I feel about it. I, my natural response is to go, no, because there are these rules of engagement that we have in, in dealing with each other. If you take those away, then, I don't know, there's chaos, but maybe that's not the case. Maybe there is an authenticity in being able to be whoever you want to be and to express yourself in ways unrestricted by convention. I don't know, it's a provocative statement, I like it. Uh, another quote there is, uh, is, is from our colleagues in, at the University of Western Sydney. Citizens are no longer stable, homogenised, nor bound to a single nation or place. It could be suggested that there's now no longer citizenship, there are only tribes. Now let's zoom out in the penultimate part of this, this, this little journey tonight and put this in the context of population change. One of the others of the big four that I refer to. In Australia, the number of young people as a proportion of the population is shrinking. Between 1960 and 2010, uh, the population was aged 65 years and over grew from 8.5 to 13%. The proportion of people over 65 years is expected to increase from 13% to 25% by 2056, according to ABS figures. Where on the other hand, young people under the age of 15 made up just 20% of the population in 2007. This proportion is expected to decrease to between 15 to 18% by 2056. Big growth in older members of the population, shrinkage of uh, younger members of the population. Migration notwithstanding. Globally, it's estimated that there will only be three working people to every two people aged over 65 by 2070. Three working age people for every two people over the age of 65. This uh, shows fertility rates and I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, the blue area suggests, uh, just roughly speaking, uh, where the fertility rates, where the families are having two kids per family. The brighter coloured ones suggest where far more 
uh, uh, they're having far uh, many more kids. Um, although we've witnessed a little resurgence recently in terms of the birth of babies, where we, we have relatively low fertility rates in this country, it mirrors other countries throughout the world. Um, in the most extreme cases, we see Japan, which is just not replacing its population. It's, it's in deep trouble unless it turns to migration. It is simply not a sustainable society based on these projections. Half the population of the world now lives in countries where those of child rearing, uh, childbearing age are having fewer than two children on average. So the implication of this is that we're going to have a demographic shift in our society. It's already started to change. And so the need to develop and think about how we are preparing these young people for these radical shifts. I mean, you think about it in terms of shifts in the nature for everything from super through to how we care and think about our aged population because the pivot of responsibility is going to change, migration notwithstanding. Now let's think about migration. There are more people living inside this circle than outside of it. Those people number around 7.1 billion, and they live in South and East Asia. We sit right here. And the problem and the challenge is, is that we have such an ambiguous relationship to Asia. We have an ambigu ambiguous relationship to cultural diversity in itself. How do we know this? It would strike me as odd that a society that's based on migration flows extending right back throughout our history, should have such a high prevalence of racism. Um, a study done of school students roughly mirroring the distribution of the population a few years ago found that 7 in 10 experienced racism. Of those 7 in 10, that the racism was particularly generated at second and third uh, generation immigrants, or migrants I should say. If you're a migrant girl aged uh, in year 11, you are in the most vulnerable group. The other most vulnerable group were Indigenous Australians. They experienced a different kind of racism to that group, where the racism uh, for migrants, for example, tended to be taunts, although at their most extreme would be threats of violence. Indigenous young people reported just experiencing it throughout their lives as almost part of the furniture. A sad scene. So we had this ambiguous relation to, to, to racism. Other studies of young people aged uh, 18 to 24, I think is the age group, they found that they favoured cultural diversity, but that some people may not belong. That some people may not belong. We've also found that society, uh, society overall uh, is a tolerant society and, and is predisposed to diversity, but and this, this recent study, another one that came out of the University of Western Sydney, very prolific in these areas, uh, found that hardcore racism in about one in ten Australians. And that this was hardcore racism. So what we have is we, we, we have this ambiguous relationship. Now, if we put these two together and we say, well, we're in the, in the so-called Asian century, Australia is becoming more integrated into the region, that there are these flows of people, flows through technologies, flows physically, then this is a challenge that we're not going to be able to turn away from. I mean, it's ironic, given that our society is made of the very fabric of diversity. I'm sure I had something else to say there. Maybe I said too much. Um, there are 62 birthplace groups with more than 10,000 members in Australia, making it one of the most ethnically diverse in the world. The percentage of Australians born in Australia, New Zealand and the UK and Ireland has decreased from just under 98% in 1947 to 81-82%. Uh, in, the 2000, in 2011. One in five young Australians are born overseas, one in five speaks a language other than English at home, and it's not just a one-way street. There are close to 500,000 diaspora or young people, uh, Australians working in Asia at present, um, which is a strikingly large number as a proportion of the population. Are we ready for the Asian century? Plucked a quote that I read in uh, the periodical The Monthly. 
fellow White says, now the industrial revolution is finally reaching the rest of the world and the effects are being felt quickly. The global balance of wealth and power is swinging back towards Asia. For the first time in our history, our Asian neighbours will not be just richer than us, they will be richer than our Western allies. There are economic and cultural imperatives to understand how young people relate to diversity and, how, and what kind of mantle diversity that will be carried forward as we enter these, uh, these interesting times. So, the final part of this presentation, what are the implications for educators? I'm going to keep this top line um, because I think I've probably covered enough. But let's start with the cultural diversity dimension. I'm just going to pluck a few things out here. Again, just cherry picking. Language is important. In 2010, only 18% of Australian school students studied an Asian language. This decreased by 5 point, to only 5.4% by year 12. Incredibly, over 15 years, over the last 15 years, the uptake of Asian languages has barely increased. It's remained almost stable. Now, we've got this new imperative under the Australian curriculum, um, but there's still quite a bit of work to be done. In 2011, 300 students who did not have a Chinese background were studying Chinese in year 12. Japanese declined 20% since 2005. Koreans taught in only a handful of schools. Indonesian was losing 10,000 students a year. And as Kathy Kirby has pointed out, uh, if this pattern continues, there will be no students studying Indonesian by the year 2020. She also points out rightly that most students in other developed countries exit schooling with two or more languages to engage in an interconnected world. And radical innovation is needed as to how we think about language instruction, uh, new pedagogies and making, forging those stronger links across the, across the uh, life cycle for young people. The other side of that is how we can develop cultural competencies. And we, these cultural competencies are, are actually actively taught in some curricula throughout the world. They are something that you can actually develop and instruct and teach and harness and nourish within school environments. But we don't pay a great deal of attention to these, these other types of literacies. Encounters with differences, the studies show, uh, can change attitudes and behaviours. Being exposed to difference can actually change one's view towards uh, the other racially. Turning out of political and civic participation. Children and young people recognise the importance of understanding how our political system works, but civics and citizenship has really struggled to capture the imagination of young people. There's been some really great developments in the last 20 years and certainly uh, a shift, a very positive shift in thinking. But a lot of those efforts outside of uh, certain school environments, certain educational environments, have not necessarily been, uh, been successful. And this is, uh, is going to lead to one of my, my kind of key points educationally. When you ask young people what is it that they're looking for within a school, what, what are their preferences, there are a number of studies that confirm that one of the things they value most is hands-on learning, being able to connect what they're studying to real-world examples. And, and most of you will be going, sure, we, we know this. But to what extent are we doing it? To what extent, for example, uh, are we practicing and recognising democracies within our schools? To what extent are schools democratic structures? Uh, and there are a lot of schools that, are, that, that um, are, are doing some interesting work in this area, but schools tend to replicate the same sort of institutions that young people encounter elsewhere in life. Didactic, top-down, not participatory. Um, and I'm not talking about participation on things like school councils, which young people often view as tokenistic. They see, they have to see the efficacy, the connection between that participation and a meaningful outcome. Just like in politics, just like in broader life. Hands-on learning is actually remains really important and demonstrating that through practice uh, I, I, I think, you know, and, and of course in civics and citizenship education this has been recognised. It's much harder to do in practice within the structures of schools. A 38 country study involving more than 140,000 students found that active participation by students in the community was relatively uncommon. Schools remain often fortress-like structures whether there is a, actually a school gate or an invisible wall, they tend to be internal looking. And we've seen a shift in policy over time, which I think is very favourable towards making schools more interconnected with their communities. Schools that have at-risk kids 
have to do this by their very nature. They remain connected to welfare organisations, to the police, to others. They have to do it as part of their everyday practice. But we want to look at building on that, but actually developing positive relationships between schools and their communities, embedded uh, in, in not in just the learning of the young people within those schools, but with the professional development of their teachers. We still have a pretty narrow sense of the practicum, for example, uh, within our education system, the practicum for teachers. To what extent does this practicum prepare teachers for understanding these fluid worlds of work that I've been describing, for example? To what extent do the current generation of teachers understand exactly the nature of that fluidity, or they perhaps they understand it, but moreover, practically deal with it and engage with it in preparing young people for this, this, this fluidity in, in working life. That's just one example. But also providing practical hands-on opportunities for teachers in terms of upskilling, in terms of being able to connect with commercial organisations around them as well as social, non-for-profit and others. A whole separate discussion. Connection is important. Our education systems, as I've just said, lack opportunities uh, for students to participate in shaping school and community life. And the great scholar Alan Luke, recently retired, said any official curriculum comes to ground via an enacted curriculum of teaching and learning events lived by students and teachers. He argues for visible connections of school knowledge to everyday civic, cultural, political and social life. And he's bang on the money. Given young people's recognition of the big ticket issues discussed throughout this presentation, directing learning towards addressing those challenges of the 21st century provides an ideal opportunity to engage young people in relevant hands-on learning. Again, plenty of schools out there, plenty of classrooms where they're doing just that. They're getting students of physics, students of economics, students of politics to actually engage with the issue of well, how do we address climate change or how do we address population change, or how do we address a changing working life. But actually a lot of these issues can be taught across the curriculum. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have with, say, cultural diversity is that we still rely on the Harmony Day model, for example, of cultural diversity. You know, the festival or the foods and the whatever the other... What's the third F, Libby? The foods festival and... Flags. Flags, thank you, right? One-off, tokenistic, add-on curriculum pieces instead of what we know from the research is that addressing and engaging cultural diversity is something that's conscious, it's embedded within the governance, the pedagogy, the curriculum and the practice of schools. This actually applies to these other issues. I think that these big ticket items could actually and should be systematically taught across these, uh, across these different areas. They offer, and, and we do have some efforts with, uh, at this within the Australian curriculum, but I think we could be doing more. These are things that can be taught across disciplines. They're things that respond to what students say that they're interested in, and it provides this great intersection between the big issues that they're interested in and the desire for hands-on applied examples. And heck, a bunch of them might actually you know, address and solve some of these problems. How aligned is schooling, vocational education and higher education to young people's expectations in light of fluid worlds of work and global change? How do we need to uh, rethink those pathways from school to higher education, for example? Um, you know, I, I ended up in a discussion with a, with, with a fellow who worked at a, at a philanthropic organisation a few years ago, and I tell this story a lot because I think it exemplifies things quite well. Um, he was saying, well, you know, if we're going to provide these other structured pathways for young people outside of Year 12 to higher education, what would they look like? And I provided examples not unlike the DOTS program we have here, but also building up the vocational and training education pathways. I gave the example of, of Germany as one that has a, a deeply embedded sense of pathways that go right throughout the school system and across life. And he said, well, but that's just streaming students, right? That's just streaming students. Well, I said, well, what's the alternative? This country offers one stream and the rest are peripheral. We don't uh, dedicate the same level of investment, thinking of time into those alternative pathways other than the ones that lead here. To what extent are students engaged in learning across formal and informal domains of life? And we're grappling with how we extend the classroom through flipped class models and others about how to extend learning and take advantage of times like this where we have, might, might have face-to-face -face engagement and extending learning in, into other areas. Changing pedagogy is key here. I won't worry about the Finland example. 
While young people may not necessarily be active participants in politics, they are active learners. So we need to make a stronger connection between active learning and active citizenship. The big four should be taught or could be taught across curriculum to address these challenges in interdisciplinary ways. Developing foundational and soft skills are important. Soft skills are things like problem solving, cultural competencies, digital literacies, um, things that are actually cultivated in other education systems and indeed other parts of life in Australia but aren't necessarily applied within our education systems. We've had a lot of energy directed towards these soft skills, for example, in the adult working sector but not amongst young people. Again, lots of schools and it's there in the curriculum, the cultivation of certain of these uh, soft skills, but I don't think they go far enough. And they certainly don't go as far as some curricula like the IB curriculum does amongst others. And we've seen growing attention in countries like the UK and indeed in South Australia towards how can we develop these soft skills in, in young people. Um, soft skills is a bad term because, you know, essentially these skills are about things that you would apply across life. These foundational skills are critical, particularly where one has to adapt. In the fluidity of working life, um, being able to meet that and adapt to that is actually quite important. And there are other connections. The OECD is about to put out some research um, that's looking at the connections between the development of foundation skills and levels of trust, trust between people, trust and, and society, between understanding of political issues, um, and between the interconnectedness of the level of schooling and foundational skills and these political, economic and social domains. An interesting quote by a fellow who was out there recently, thank you John, who said, the world economy doesn't pay you for what you know but what you can do with what you know, which I thought was an interesting idea. Not unproblematic but interesting nonetheless. I have outlined what some of these are and how they might be important to a changing labour market. This doesn't detract from the importance of, of the basics. New students entering university have been seen to be underprepared in some areas in quantitative fields. Basic level of maths is now the most commonly completed maths course at year 12, while the study of intermediate maths has declined. Underpinning all of this is the nature of schooling. Schooling essentially hasn't changed in its basic structure for 80, 90 years. It's an industrial model of schooling. To what extent does an industrial model of schooling prepare young people for the changes in light of what I've discussed above? It goes to the very core of what we mean. Now, it's obviously not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but it's to understand that these institutions have limitations. We have to really rethink about how, they're, how appropriate they are for this change in life. There's other differences there that mirror their, di their digital literacy, but I, I won't talk about them now. We have fluidity on the one level in terms of changes in the workforce and changes in voting patterns and shifts uh, and, and broader shifts in the way that people engage socially. But underpinning them, we actually still have hard trends. These hard trends are things like even though we might have greater fluidity in the working force, we see year on year on year that the most vulnerable young people continue to be those living in regional and remote areas, those from low SES backgrounds, those who become disengaged from school early, and those from Indigenous backgrounds, and those experiencing disability. Again and again and again, we see those groups coming out in the data. There are structures of marginalisation and structures that exist beneath these waves of, of, of fluidity. I've talked about how the boundaries are changing. Our boundary in terms of our relationship to Asia is changing. Our boundaries interpersonally are changing. The boundaries between us and our global responsibilities are changing. Hands-on learning is important, as I've pointed out. But the strategies that we adopt, particularly in the area of technology, are only as good as the educational approaches and goals underpinning them. And I guess fundamentally underneath all of this is what is the moral purpose of education? What comes out of the surveys with teachers as to why they get up and do their job? And I'm referring to data from like the Talis data, for example. Why, why do you get up and do your job? And the most common response is the moral purpose of education. And these challenges that I've described really invite an opportunity to revisit what is the moral purpose of what we're doing? And are we actually preparing young people for those big ticket items, for the big four? As I've said, concerns for the world's environment consistently rate highly as the top three issues of importance. And the idea of the common good 
will no longer be something that's argued about amongst political theorists. It will become a necessity in how we care for each other, how we relate to each other culturally, how we relate to those who are older than us or younger than us, how we relate technologically. There's a lens there which is changing, the, that I think can change the way we view the world and view education. A key to adaptability and preparing young people for adaptability, I think, is learning how to learn. Connecting learning to the big issues is one way of inspiring this. Because if you're going to adapt and change careers it, within this fluidity, however uh, ideal or preferable that is, being able to learn how to learn becomes critical here. Young people may be more connected than ever technologically, but a primary goal of education should be to keep them connected to what they're learning, to their, connecting their learning to their world. Making these connections continues to be an important challenge for all of us, as well as our political representatives. And as I've said in this, this recent thing in terms of uh, this upcoming election, capturing their votes about capturing their imagination. Regardless, these big, ticket, these big ticket items will either directly or indirectly define our future, both in the forthcoming election and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>